So uh, back uh, 1990, I had a student, and she wrote an essay about her uh, younger brother who uh, could barely afford anything, but somehow he managed to lease a BMW and get himself a, a condo in Brentwood. And all of his money went to the uh, BMW and the condo. And uh, he had to wear hand-me-downs, Salvation Army clothes. He had to eat government cheese. He had to go over to his sister's house and eat sometimes because he was starving. I think she said he was eating saltine crackers and sardines. And he was pretty much a guy who uh, was um, living for image because he craved, you know, the flattery of other people. I don't think there's anything wrong with craving flattery. I think it's, um, I think it's human nature. So this morning I'm writing uh, at about 5.30 in the morning. That's when I get up because I can't sleep. And uh, my back hurts. I'm not going to be able to work out today. I got a stiff back. I'm all ticked off. I got ice on my lower back. I just took uh, Motrin. I'm saying to myself, dude, you're not going to be able to work out. And I'm writing and, and about flattery because that's the theme of, of today's presentation. I look down at my uh, Seiko Prospects 061 and I'm thinking, hmm, I'm not sure this... Seiko Prospects 061 flatters me enough. I just, I don't know, man. I think I need a Grand Seiko to flatter me enough because I'm a man of distinction. I need a watch that rises to the occasion and captures my distinction, my, my essence. And I was thinking that, uh, you know, flattery is really what makes human beings tick. We use flattery to bond with one another, to connect with one another, to validate one another and is an expression of love, if you think about it. I mean, sincere flattery is really what makes the world go around. Oh my God, your playlist on your iPod is amazing. What amazing taste you have in music. You're the taste maker. Can I take home your playlist and take some notes and, and copy and paste all your wonderful songs? Unbelievable. You know that YouTube video you made last week? My wife and I watch it over and over again. We just laugh. You are so talented. How come you didn't become uh, a famous comedian? I don't know. You're just too modest, man. What kind of watch is that? How come I've never seen it? You're amazing. Oh my God, I've eaten tiramisu before, but the tiramisu you made is unbelievable. I mean, I'm never going to eat any other tiramisu again. <laughs> we crave flattery because it validates who we are. And I understand that. You know what's interesting though? How much we crave uh, flattery and self-validation depends on how much love we got as kids or how much love we didn't get as kids. If we didn't get a baseline of love as children, what happens is we just got these huge Swiss cheese holes in our psyche and, and we just can't get enough flattery. I mean, all the flattery in the world just can never appease our appetites. And so, you know, I'm, I've known people over the years who'd never got any love as kids. Either their parents were addicts, you know, they suffered from some addiction, they were neglectful, they were abusive. I've known people who've been abandoned by their parents. I know one kid, he's a uh, former student of mine, he's now in his late 20s. At the age of six years old, his mother was diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia and she was put away in a mental institution and he pretty much grew up without a mother and not surprisingly, you know, based on my interactions with him, I, I believe he suffers from depression and an inability to connect well with people, though he does well uh, academically. And so I've seen extremes of people who didn't get love in their life and, and one of the common symptoms is that you grow up needing lots of flattery. Now I also have seen people raised in families where there was intense, abundant love. And it reminds me of a story of when I was in high school. I knew these two brothers. They were twin brothers and they were from Argentina. They were immigrants from Argentina, Mike and Alex. We were friends because we were book nerds. I don't know, we got teased. I didn't get bullied, I was a pretty big dude. I, I didn't get bullied. Mike and Alex, they weren't big like I was. They got, uh, well, I know they got bullied once. Cause one day, Winnie, about six foot five, this guy named Winnie, six five, wearing Doc Martens, he, he did something to Mike. I don't know if he pushed Mike. I don't know if he punched him. I don't know what happened. But Alex saw Winnie bullying his brother Mike, and Alex tore into Winnie. I've never seen anything like it. 
little Alex versus giant Winnie. Alex was all heart. And I remember as he was tearing into Winnie, he was saying, don't you ever touch my brother again. And he tore, tore into Winnie. Winnie fell to the ground, pummeled with uh, punches, and would just lie there like a sack of uh, embarrassment and shame. And I saw Winnie later that day. He looked ashen. He looked ashamed. He looked like a dude who saw a ghost. He looked like a dude who found the truth. And then I remember the next day I went up to uh, Alex and I shook his hand. I said, Alex, you love your brother, man. That is the most palpable display of love I have ever seen in my life. And as I think about the love of, of Alex and Mike and their family from Argentina, it reminds me of a book I read called The Savage God by A. Alvarez. And in that book, he says, the closer you get to the equator, the stronger family connections and the less people are alone and the less rates of suicide, smaller rates of suicide. The farther you get from the equator, north or south, people tend to live more uh, in isolated conditions and there's higher suicide levels. I thought about that as I thought of the abundance of uh, Mike and Alex. And I don't think they're watch addicts to this day. I don't think they're obsessed with materialism. I think the love, the ferocious love they got in their childhood is the foundation of their lives. And I, and, uh, I admire them for that. That's amazing. And as I think about them, I'm now going to think of the opposite. I'm thinking of Robin Williams, who suffered from depression and tragically took his life a while back. The famous comedian Robin Williams was a watch obsessive. He loved watches and he collected toys as an adult. He collected toy soldiers, you know, figurines. I don't know if they were G.I. Joe action dolls. I think they're these really expensive, expensive military action figures. He kept them in his own room. It was called the special room because as a kid he grew up lonely and depressed and he needed to live in that world to, uh, to I guess, to medicate himself, so to speak. And so Robin Williams in a special room reminds me of a conversation I ha had with my daughter Natalie. I was picking her up for summer school or driving home and she says, Daddy, I want to live in a mansion. And I said, Natalie, I'd like to live in a mansion too. Yeah, five million dollar mansion. You can have all the rooms you want, Natalie, and I'll have all the rooms I want. And I guarantee you, Natalie, one of my rooms is going to be a watch museum. I'm going to have hundreds and hundreds of, uh, of luxury timepieces, man. And every morning, Natalie, I'm going to look at those timepieces and I'm going to go, I don't know which one to wear. And I'm going to go crazy. And Natalie's laughing at me. And I'm thinking, hey, you know what, man? Flattery's okay. I think too much flattery is a poison. It could drive you crazy. I wonder if I just got one Grand Seiko. Uh, probably have to be a 42, because I put on a 40 millimeter uh, watch at the watch store yesterday. I wasn't feeling the love, man. Looks like I'd have to save for a 42. But, you know, maybe, I wonder if a Grand Seiko would be too much flattery, just the right amount of flattery, not enough. I don't know. Only time will tell, ladies and gentlemen. Until next time, I'm out.